everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Modern Merchant Podcast. Uh, my name is Austin. I'm your host. I'm the go-to-market director here at FlexPoint. With me, as always, I have Travis Marier. He's the CEO of FlexPoint. And in today's episode, we have a very special guest. Uh, we have Rick Watson. He's CEO and founder of RMW Commerce Consulting and probably a million other things you see on LinkedIn and all the other spots that he's uh, out there doing earnings calls and um, a lot of great insight. We're really excited about this, you know, from an e-commerce perspective perspective. And uh, I've been, you know, super pumped to get you on here, Rick. Thanks for jumping on. No, thanks a lot, Austin and Travis. Uh, I appreciate you guys asking me on. Yeah, absolutely. And so just to get started, um, I mean, a lot of people, if they're in this space, you know, they've heard of your name, they've uh, seen a lot of your posts and a lot of the insight and content that you, you put out there. But just give us a quick little update on what you're doing right now, um, whether it's with the consulting agency that you started um, and anything other than that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm CEO and founder of a boutique e-commerce consulting firm in New York City called RMW Commerce. And you know, with that, I work with uh, mostly with brands. A lot of them are, are venture backed or private equity backed, and they're looking to make some kind of transformation and accelerate their e-commerce sales. So many of them have been doing business for a long time, and they don't have the internal talent or the vision to kind of take the next steps to accelerate their business. So um, hiring, giving what it is, it's hard to find digital talent everywhere. Uh, and so people are more open to having someone from the outside come in and take a look at things that are happening and suggest sort of next steps. So that's kind of uh, the business side, uh, which has been a lot of fun and accelerated through COVID, which has been great. Um, I also just in the last month started a new podcast called the Watson Weekly, which sort of takes my sort of LinkedIn quick analysis idea and puts it into a weekly podcast format. Um, so that's, that's been fun getting started as well. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome. And, and we're going to tune into a couple more of those podcast episodes and, and really to get us started um, because what I did is I saw kind of where you started in, you know, your career, it looks like your background started in software development, right. To get started. Uh, so take us back to that. And, and, and how did that get started for you? You know, were you always interested into that development software engineering type of role and, and when did it start shifting into the e-commerce realm? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I love technology and computers growing up. Uh, you know, I got, uh, an Apple IIe back in 84. Uh, and that's kind of my start in development uh, in school. I finished my master's in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, you know, e-commerce wasn't a thing uh, really at all back then. But, you know, a lot of the first generation web companies were starting to come up even pre-Google. And so I, I joined a star startup a uh, software company in North Carolina called Stingray Software uh, and a number of folks there. And within a, a year of me starting, uh, the founder, so the founder of that company was a gentleman by the name of Scott Wingo, who you may know, uh, is and, and ended up eventually being the founder of Channel Advisor. And so he basically took five or six people from that original company and founded uh, Auction Roper you know, at the time. And so that's kind of how I found my way into e-commerce. Um, you know, the people that, that founded uh, Auction Rover, um, you know, were some of the smartest people I knew in the company. And, you know, I kind of like went, you know, a couple of months after it was founded, kind of went and knocked on the door. It's like, hey, can I help and join you guys? So I was, you know, one of the first 10 employees, something like that. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah auction, go ahead, yeah, Auction Rover. Uh, did that evolve into Channel Advisor or was there, yeah, right? Because if Scott was running Auction Rover, he probably, you know, so it almost was rebranded if that or? or yeah, what, what so the, the trajectory was Auction, it's such a crazy time because Auction Rover was founded essentially like July, August, 99. I joined in December. Um, the company had zero revenue, but was bought for a hundred million dollars by goto.com and like, April of 2000. If you kind of remember anything about that time, it was like yeah. three weeks before the dot com crash. Right. So that tells you a little bit about Scott's business sense and timing, uh, which was all has always been brilliant. Um, so while we were part of goto.com, which was a public company, basically goto, if you know anything about their history, they invented essentially paid search. 
So mm-hmm. just the idea that people would buy ads on search engines, go to.com came up with that whole concept that then Google st- stole from them basically and crushed everyone. Um, and so at, while we were part of goto.com, we started developing seller tools. And so Auction Mode was originally basically an auction search engine aggregator. So a buyer would come here to search one place to search dozens of different auction sites. There wasn't just sort of eBay at the time. And we started building tools for, tel- uh, tools for sellers, like power sellers on eBay that were selling out of their garage in their basement. Right. And as we were doing that, there was one month where Sun Microsystems signed up for our free tool and within a month had sold $50,000 worth of servers. And this was in like the end of 2000. Yeah. And so that was really Scott's light bulb moment for like, holy cow, there is something here and big businesses are going to make a lot of money selling uh, things on marketplaces. And this is before Amazon even came on the scene in marketplaces at all. Uh, so that, that, I think that was the light bulb moment, which then he bought the company back from the people that acquired him in 2001. And at that time, he rebranded the company as, you know, wow. essentially reformed the company as channel advisor, taking it back private for a fraction of what the, he sold it for, of course. Yeah. And then because um, they were looking to get rid of the asset because they were a search engine. We were essentially at that time becoming a software company. Uh, and he's wow. like, oh, there, I have this little idea I want to explore. Let me buy it back from you. Uh, and, and so he bought it back and then the same people, I mean, the, the same building, the same people, it was just a new name. You know? Wow. wow. I, we've seen that a couple of times, like, uh, AmeriCommerce did that with Capital One, you know, similar. I mean, I don't know how much yeah. it was one-to-one and they kind of went on to be acquired by card.com and things like that. So it's always interesting to see that, that, that period of time, that dot-com bust, I've heard so many stories, um, about that. It must have been a wild time, and it sounds like it was with you know so much money being made and lost all all within like a five year period. Right. Um, our our executive chairman was part of the e commerce business around that time. Uh, Infopia, I don't know if you ever came across those guys. Infopia were were definitely you know I I remember the company. They were based in Utah. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I knew I knew some of the some of the folks that were there at the time. Yeah, he was a developer for him. It was one of his first uh, jobs and. Uh, got him interested in in what we do now, obviously the e-commerce side. But yeah. it was interesting to see, you know, Channel Advisor, obviously one of those first, you know, the first company to really just take e-commerce software to the next level. And at least it looks like you've been there. Um, you know, you were there for for quite a while, you know, in, in, in software world. Um, you know, over the nine years you were there, any kind of just would love to know, like from startup Channel Advisor to when you left, just curious how you could take us through a memory lane jog of just how it changed and the interesting inflection points uh, throughout your career there. Yeah. I mean, I think um, early on, we were mostly about small sellers. Uh, and so, you know, it was basically just taking the idea that you should be, if you're selling, uh, you know, 30 items a month, how do we get you selling, you know, a thousand items a month? is really kind of that inflection point. So it's like a little bit more than a hobby, but not yet a full-time business. How can we help people sort of scale mm-hmm. that business for people who have access to supply? So, you know, we had a, um, a couple of inflection points. We had a product called Channel Advisor Pro, which, which was, you know, at the time we said it was free forever, you know, because no mm-hmm. one was care- cared about making money. And so a big inflection point was to start charging for Channel Advisor Pro, which we developed our own billing system in-house, which is a huge project right. for us, not only in the engineering side of it, but also sort of the community management side of it. So I, you know, I can't remember how many sellers we had at the time, but probably at least a thousand uh, sellers that were on the platform. And just the idea that something you told, you literally hit, sellers are ri- literally had on record that like, this is going to be free forever. And now you're going to come back to them and saying it's going to be 30 bucks a month or like whatever it is. Uh, I mean, the reality is like 90 plus, you know, which is a, sort of a good business lesson, 95% of those people ended up staying on because they found value in what you were doing. And, you know, the software was very professional and there were no bugs and it worked, you know what I mean? So as long as you have that, so that was sort of, I think the first big inflection point uh, you know, that we had, uh, you know, in, in those years. Very cool. Yeah. It's, it's always fun to watch that kind of rocket ship growth and, and be testing constantly in a startup like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, channel vibes are still very prominent today, public company. Um, you know, we are seeing this new breed of, of software come through, you know, SaaS solutions, 
um, in the cart world, right? Shopify, obviously the, the, mm -hmm. the big, the big boy. Um, you're seeing these new companies like Vtex and, you know, uh -huh. comp competing against the Shopify plus side, uh, cart.com just raised a ton of money, um, yeah. going after, you know, I almost a little bit of a different approach, uh, bringing everything into one kind of, uh, centralized platform and kind of differentiating from like the traditional Shopify and big commerce model of the app store type approach. You, you need to add more things to really get all the functionality, um, at least for the enterprise type customer, at least the, mm -hmm. the top tier mid market, at least. Um, curious on how you think about that, right? There's a lot of value in the do something really well, simply, and then let your developers build ecosystem around that. And there, there's also value in kind of the, you know, all in one because it works better and you don't have to worry about, you know, 16 different billing companies. So I'm curious how you think about, is that a strong differentiator you see has legs? Um, and just those two models in general and how you see they might play out in the future. Yeah, it's, you know, it's always the push and pull. I mean, if you look at any market anywhere from cable to cell phones to, you know, whatever, there's always either integration or sort of dispersion where things get, you know, bundling and unbundling is, you know, mm -hmm. another way to refer to it, you know, with Netflix. And now everything is kind of getting back into bundles again after being unbundled for a time. So software is kind of the same way. And it kind of depends on what cycle you're in. Um, I would say in general, um, the web browser has really just become the platform for everyone. And to, so to switch from one thing to another has become super simple. Uh, the big challenge has been the integration right. of all these data sources into one thing. If you're a small and medium business, I would say in general, the smaller the merchant, the more likely they are to want everything in one place mm -hmm. because they it's simpler for them to understand being new to a, like a new business. They don't want to have 10 different dashboards or 10 different remote controls uh, to control. They just want one remote control because they're just trying to prove that the business works and it's not maybe a full-time thing. Bigger companies tend to be okay with having multiple providers yeah. as a rule. But uh, again, you get different corporate philosophies too. So what I would say is, especially it's something that's evolving as quickly as e-commerce, I tend to lean toward the best in breed Yep. side than the all-in-one side because it's really really hard for someone to be an expert in one thing and to for some for any one company to be an expert in 10 things mm -hmm. uh tends to be super complicated and to keep up with the not only just to have the function because there's one thing having the function you can check a box yes we have that you know or like but the idea that you can do it really well and best in class becomes much more difficult yeah, no, for sure. Um, always interested in, you're right. It's definitely that, that pu push and pull and, you know, the bundling and unbundling. And I, it, I think it's, an, we were talking with Jay at Bold about something similar, because it's just a topic that's super interesting to me because it's never ending. It's the spectrum that's never ending. And so I always love to talk to, you know, knowledge leaders about where we're at in that spectrum yeah. um, and really what's a differentiator, right? And so Shopify has been at the top. Everyone looks at them as, like you said, best in breed. Um, big commerce is, is climbing, coming after them, right? There's other companies, VTechs, that are kind of new on the block. Um, how do you see, uh, what, it, maybe it's not the all-in-one versus app, but like differentiating. You know, Shopify is the, for me and a lot of people in the space, it's like that, of course, just go Shopify, right? And big <laughs> commerce is, is kind of pushing towards the B2B side. Maybe they're differentiating there. What kind of strategies, whether it's in the cart world or just e-commerce in general, where do you think the differentiation uh, is going to be here in the future and, and how people are going to be thinking about, you know, getting away from the, the top dogs today? Yeah, I, I think the differentiator for a lot of these people is how much flexibility do they need um, to the extent that, okay, the front end is fine. I can have a CMS on the front end, whether it's Shopify CMS or someone else's content management system. And the cart is mostly the same, but maybe there's some customizability you need, or maybe you need payment methods that your provider doesn't offer. And so usually it has to do with the amount of flexibility you need and how many levers and things you need to switch out in your platform. And so if you are the primary use case of Shopify, then it's very, it's very hard to get in the room, you know, if you're in an RFP or anything else with any other platform, um, because you're in their primary use case. So I think 
the needs of your buyers to the extent that your buyer isn't just trying to look for a one-click checkout, and that is just not in the realm, particularly like B2B complex scenarios where there might be regulatory requirements and ver extra verifications and right. payment and invoicing requirements. Shopify like, it was never designed for that kind of thing. And so I think checkout is definitely one of the biggest pivot points that I see in the e-commerce space, whether it's in the consumer side or on the business customer yeah. side. So that's kind of one. And I, I think second is um, B2B wholesale retail locations. Like, you know, if you have 50 retail stores, you know, most people aren't like thinking Shopify day one, you know, mm -hmm. they might be thinking square and then they might be finding an independent e-com platform. So people come from different perspectives. I and mean, we always talking to a Shopify sales rep the other day. And, and even, even those guys who are like, yeah, if someone has over 20 stores, like we don't even bring up our POS. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not even in the radar. So I, I think they even have some you know, if you are primarily a wholesale business, Shopify may not be the right fit for you. So I think B2B and wholesale is kind of another pivot point that I typically um, typically see from people um, that goes to more in a direction of like a square that's more just a POS first company. Like, right. you know, it was founded as like the first card reader for your iPhone and then developed you know, other things, particularly like payments and things like that. So it's like physical versus digital first almost, right? Like Yeah, you start which is kind of funny square. because Square is also very digitally oriented, but physical too, you know what I mean? Yeah. The more interaction, right? Yeah, but you're right. I definitely think like if I've got 50 stores and I'm trying to just be more digitally, you know, enabled, if you will, I'm, I'm going to go with my a POS first type brand versus someone that's more like the online store brand when I care about that secondary, right? Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It, you know, kind of shifting gears a little bit from software, but you were touching on it a little bit and, and you talk about it, you know, consistently through your, your podcast and your and LinkedIn and things like that, but the shift in retail. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is one that I've always just, um, toyed around my mind. And I'm just curious on your thoughts on, there's been this rise in direct to consumer where prior to, uh, direct to consumer and the enablement of social media and platforms like Shopify, you know, you want to get your new brand, your new product that you've created, your line of products, you sold it to department stores or you sold it to brick and mortars and they, they sold it, right? And there's now direct consumer. It's kind of broken up the supply chain. A little bit distributors have been broken down as well with the rise of 3PLs. So the question, I guess, is, you know, the, the middleman approach of selling through to a retailer. Mm -hmm. um, still very much, there's still, uh, that's a viable channel, right? But what, how do you see direct to consumer? Do you see it threatening that traditional resell approach at all? Um, some a little bit, or is it, you know, there will always be a middleman and it just, it just needs to kind of shake out and, um, you know, find its way. Yeah. Look, there, there's always going to be retail as long, I think, as the, we're here on the planet. And, you know, retail has a function and, and I, fundamentally, the way I've always thought about it, and look, when I got into this 20 years ago, I didn't know a thing about retail or e-commerce or anything more than anyone else. Um, but fundamentally, if you're a manufacturer, you're good at making things, like making a great product with certain features and functions that solves a problem in the world. And fundamentally, if you're a retailer, you're really good at marketing <laughs> yep. at the end of the day. And you're real good at helping people make decisions about the types of things you want. And so just because you can make a product that don't, don't, doesn't mean you know how to talk to a customer yeah. or to describe that product to the customer well. You're just a, you know, it could be a great engineer, you could be a great designer, but that's different than being a great salesperson right. or, or a great merchant. But, so I think as long as that is true, um, there will be both types of organizations uh, forever. So um, the, but it, the fact that direct to consumer, the barrier to entry to selling to a consumer has just gotten so much lower for that ma for the manufacturer side of the equation. There's like, mm -hmm. you know what? I can hire a few. Like, they've kind of figured out some of the things that the retailer is doing. Right? Like, you know what? If I think about this stuff from the beginning, like 
if I, I can take better photography, I can describe my products a little better. Um, I can, I can figure out how many bullet points Amazon wants. Like, why can't I do this all on my yeah. own, particularly with the rise of Amazon. And so I think just the barrier to entry has gotten a lot lower um, where, I mean, I could tell you, even to this day, there are so many manufacturers that once they get a PO, <laughs> for, for, for the product, they don't want to think about it ever again. Like, don't ever send me a return. <laughs> you know, I'm looking to get the next order. And that's the way I do business. Right. Well, you, you think about like the poster child DTC, like an Allbirds. They figured out really well how to sell direct to consumer. They can do just about anything, if not better than the retailers them, themselves. Right. But, you know, there's still going to be, if, so, if there's a deal to be had, if there's a partnership to be made, in another channel, then, then it's going to happen, right? I mean, I'm right. sure, I don't know if they're sold via any retailers today. And you know, there's always that aftermarket stuff. There's always that uh, liquidation side of things. That, so I'm just, you know, it's interesting because the all birds of the world didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. They almost all sold through retailers. Um, you know, there's always been Nike, but at least they weren't that common. Uh, right. But like you said, the lower entry, uh, buried entry has really accelerated that. There's no doubt. Yeah, yeah and I think, look, as long as, as long as there are places where consumers go that aren't setting foot in your store or going to your website, there's brands are going to want to be wherever the consumers are. Right. And so it doesn't mean they want those consumers to stay there forever, but um, yeah. learning, learning to learning about where, how consumers buy, particularly ones that haven't, you haven't sold to before is always going to be super valuable, whether it's on a marketplace or in a retailer. Sure. So all right, now that we've established that retail is still here, reselling products <laughs> are, is not going anywhere, um, which is good. It means that we're going to stay in business. Um, what are we seeing right now? Are we seeing like a reverse where, you know, Amazon's going to department stores, you know, everyone uh, 20 years ago, right? Walmart, everyone, they, they were pure brick and mortar, department store focused, whatever. They got an online store. Now all the digital first are going to physical, whether it's Amazon, Allbirds, people are opening up stores. Right. Well, what are we seeing right now? What, what's, what's the play? What's the major shift in the market? Yeah, I mean, I think even pre-COVID, the big shift, if you are a retailer, it's holding less inventory. <laughs> and, and so um, your, your POs were getting smaller and more frequent. And, mm -hmm. and, and so if you were placing these big orders and taking on more of the risk, you're like, okay, we'll take some of the risk. Then the rest of it, you know, that's, kind of created or accelerated sort of the dropship world, even from people that weren't used to drop shipping. You know, retailers basically started requiring brands to drop ship, even if they never had that relationship in the last 15 or 20 years, just to open an account. Right. Like, I'm not going to buy everything from you. What do you think I am crazy? And so this whole idea of first party drop ship, you know, was, was invented based on that, which is really, to me, more about the retailer kind of screwing over the brand. You know, hey, we're going to give you the same service, but we're going to buy less. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a great deal. No, it's, it's really <laughs> not a great deal for the brand because it's it's more complicated for them. So that's I think that's kind of one trend. I think with COVID in the last year, the the most interesting thing I've noticed is that there's a little bit of backtracking on that because of the supply chain, and that retailers were trying to have their cake and eat it too by like. We want a relationship with the brand. We want to buy less. But right. now, because orders aren't coming reliably and on time, they're they're ordering more right, right. to buffer against supply chain challenges. So like, if I can't get regular shipments every month, and I know that if I order something today, it might not come four months from now, and maybe it'll come eight months from now, or maybe it'll show up three months from now. I don't know. So I better have whatever I can order. I, can, I better order. Yeah. Um, which is causing constraints in warehouses now too, you know? Yeah. No, that's, that's an interesting point. Yeah. I mean, it's been a power shift back and forth, you know, supply and demand, literally supply. And demand. Right. Um, right. Uh, you know, so we've, we've all been talking about COVID and uh, you know, this shift and, and retail is not dead. Even past COVID, you can see people are opening up stores and or traditional, you know, retail. Um, I'm just curious as someone that kind of leads the space and in, in thought thought leadership, uh, what are people not talking about? And I, I know it's a curveball. We didn't send this to you. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll give you a second, but like, you know, I'm curious what maybe is underrated uh, that is not getting as much publicity that you might see in the traditional retail uh, outlets, you know, like what, what's kind of under the radar. 
Yeah, I think um, what's what's under the radar. I think um, people are still not. I think optimizing their supply chains as much as they sh- could be. Everyone still thinks about marketing and ROAS, and that's what you hear is is a lot of the conversation. But in particular for brands that are supply chains, I think are getting more complicated. And so, before I used to be, you have to ship pallets to your retailers, and that that was or or to shelf stores, you know, whatever it is. Uh, if you're selling to Home Depot or Lowe's or Walmart, you're you're, you're shipping pallets, and then direct to consumer came along and, you know, okay, now I need to learn how to ship eaches. Well, maybe it's a three PL, maybe I can do it alongside Particularly If it's a small business, I want to do it alongside my existing stock. And then Amazon came along. So it's like, well, you could sell here, but you're really not going to rank anywhere unless you are FBA. And by the way, you, you can only ship us just a little bit <laughs> right at a time and it better be selling or else we're going to charge you a lot of money or we're not going to accept it, one or both. And so now there's three things the brand needs to learn how to do. And then balancing between the two, which things I ship myself versus which things I leave on Amazon and how to make all that cost efficient. I, I still think that most brands are really struggling with that, yeah. that, that balance. And particularly because Amazon is growing so much, they're still trying to learn, you know, yeah. learn yeah. that. And, and, and by the way, Macy's or Dick's Sporting Goods, they want us to drop ship. So now figure that out. Right. right. Um, so, yeah, that's that, actually that's a really good point. Um, very cool. Yeah. I'm glad you were able to. Yeah. I, I knew you'd come <laughs> through on that. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the one that I also just thought of as you were talking earlier uh, about the dot com bust and, you know, we're seeing it. Everyone in e-commerce is seeing this like acceleration of capital into e-commerce, mm-hmm. into software, into SaaS. You know, the, the stock market's on fire. Valuations are getting crazy. Um, you know, it's because we're kind of, you know, we decided, okay, e-commerce, online, it's, it's here. It's here to stay. It's, it's the new uh, way that we do business for sure, right? COVID has definitely accelerated that. Right. Any kind of bust, you know, seeing the dot-com bust where everyone was so sure of, uh, you know, of the internet at that time and, and everything they believed in at that time to now, Anything on the horizon you might see as a potential bust or indicators leading towards a bust? Look, I mean, I, I, I won't. I won't have any sort of negative predictions about you know an entire sector or something like that. But you always kind of look. Just go back to me. It's always just goes back to fundamentals. What product are you providing? What value are you adding? And you know, and this is funny. You know, being being on this channel. A lot of people like five years ago wanted to be into drop shipping. Like, oh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to drop ship and I'm going to make a million dollars. And like, yeah. and they're like, they start to like, they're in, they're in the business for about six months. And then you like start to do the calculations. Like, Hey, I'm not making any money here. I'm like, yeah, because you're not adding any value either. Like yeah. the, pro- the product's not yours. The storage is not yours. The channel isn't yours. What do you own? Like how, where do you expect to be making any money? Um, and so I think the people that are, they're making money or a little bit more, they're adding more value. They're more vertically integrated. They have that customer relationship. They can manufacture their own product. They can source and make their own product quickly to respond to trends. And so I think that vertically people who are not vertically integrated, I think are going to continue to get squeezed, you know, in, in this world where uh, it's easy to do everything, you know what I mean? It's easy to replicate something. Um, And so if you don't, have that expertise yourself. If you're relying on someone else, uh, then that person's going to learn your business and eat your lunch. <laughs> right. And so I think that's true for some of these Amazon aggregators, you know, that are out there. There are like 150 of these companies, you know, how, ma- how many of these companies now that think it's really easy to start and grow an Amazon business. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great until the next company pops up and takes over your search result. And then what happens? Or you run out of FBA shelf space you know, then you're out of stock. Like what happens then? Right. So, yeah, those, yeah. those are the things that people that aren't just getting back to the fundamentals of great products, great marketing, great service, and establishing a long-term relationship with your customers. Yeah, for certainly having the fundamentals. I think it's different now where these are established businesses with customers. 
what you're kind of hinting on is is a good business model, right? With a moat to some extent, like you you were right. you're adding value to a customer. You know, we always talk about dropship. It is a fulfillment model, not a business model, right? <laughs> like you need it is a way to leverage. I think that's a newsflash. Well, you should like put that in red lights. That's a newsflash to a lot of people. We've been trying to preach that for, <laughs> forever because um, you know YouTube has killed the word dropship. Oh, it really oh, has, no. uh, and it's. And it, it, it's quiet. You don't have a people... garage back there, do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Check out my Lambo behind me. <laughs> right. Uh, it's because it's, it, you know, it's that get rich quick kind of scheme where, you know, that's what, that's the kind of way that it's been portrayed, but people don't realize like dropship is the only way that Amazon was able to become so big so quick, right? They don't realize that Dick's Sporting Goods, it's a major part of their strategy. It's, it is just a fulfillment model and they've added value uh, in other parts of the, of the value chain for the customer. And build a brand, right? I and mean, that's kind of what you're, right. you're touching on. Is build a brand yeah. that your customers love, um, which is you know easy to do, right? Build a yeah, brand. for sure. <laughs> um, cool. I mean, that's I mean a lot of awesome stuff there. I really, really, uh, really like a lot of those answers, and I mean it's super insightful stuff. Austin, do we? Is there anything else that we wanted to touch on? Anything that you got from your side? You, you know, know I, 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 I was I was well. curious. Yeah, I, I was curious. Um, what a you know, for people that come to you, what is the biggest myth or misconception that you're happy to correct or people get into to drop shipping? Yeah. So, you know, since we've made, you know, the, the migration or the transition over to FlexPoint, we, we deal with a different customer segment, right? So mm-hmm. we've done about two different customer segments. I'd say those that are trying to get into drop shipping, um, they think they can plug it into their existing model and their existing software. Um, it is fundamentally different. You kind of touched on it earlier with B2B where, you know, taking orders B2B from a, a cart like Shopify and you think, oh, I'll just start doing it B2B. We don't think about, you know, the, the, the fact that you don't want to keep a credit or Shopify can't keep a credit card on file. And how do I invoice and keep track of net terms? Like that same side of things on, on transferring to B2B, the right. same thing with dropship, right? My idea of a PO is sending a large bulk PO to uh, my supplier and getting freight in in my warehouse. Well, technically, when you send a dropship order, it's a PO. It's right. a PO, right? From it's just, just one. for one thing. Yeah, exactly. Thing. So, how does that work with my accounting software now? Right? How do I account for that? Um, you know, what happens when I cross dock? Where do where does where does all that go? I send a PO to my dropship supplier, then I have a fulfillment request come into my warehouse. It's not set up for that. So it is fundamentally a very different mm. workflow in their current e-commerce operation. That's what we're so bullish on. You know, those that do dropship have it as a as a fulfillment model today that works really well in their industry. And certain industries are set better set up for it, like auto and mm-hmm. you know electronics and things like that. Um, if it's currently a good model for them. You know, we're bullish on dropship becoming a more, uh, you know, really a, a more of a first class citizen in, in software. And we're really the first ones, as we believe, from order management perspective, that has made it a first class citizen. So these other order, order management systems haven't really thought about all the needs and the integration needs from a dropship perspective. So, can, so I guess to answer your question, the two segments are if you're not dropshipping, but you have an established business, and you know, e-commerce, it's not so plug and play. You need to rethink it's a different paradigm of how you run your supply chain. No, it makes sense. Yeah. I feel like, uh, like a lot of the times too, is people don't even understand specific edge cases that come up Mm. too, right? The, the different nuances of fulfilling certain brands to certain States, fulfilling certain Mm. types of items to certain countries. Like, and then the, the biggest thing that we're starting to see a lot more now too, is just international shipping. Mm. And how are we doing that with my dropship fulfillment too? So it's like, it's like, every week or every month, there's a new edge case that someone's trying to solve from an automation perspective and everybody wants to automate it too. Right. right? So it's like, how much can we automate versus how much are we just going to manually have to, you know, adhere to these? No, it's hard, especially if you have a, like a pretty diverse supplier network and your website is like, okay, I ship to Puerto Rico. That's, that's fine. But does every supplier ship to Puerto Rico? Right. No, maybe not. You know, yeah. maybe their shipping software can't support it because they're using the wrong carrier or something like that. And how do, when do you find that out as a retailer? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no doubt. It's a, it's a web of decisions, right? I mean, having that workflow engine of understanding that. And, you know, we always recommend people going back to you know, your question, right? Like that you should do things manually first, right? And then that everyone mm-hmm. wants to automate. And they think you can automate drop shipping, but we recommend mm-hmm. do things manually and then start automating one by one as mm-hmm. you can. 
Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really good advice. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing too, that I definitely wanted to hit on um, because we saw that you, you know, Rick, you went from like engineering team lead to product management, like running product to channel advisor. And then I saw a couple, you know, CEOs uh, titles at a couple different companies. What was like the, the moment that you're like, you know what, I'm going to start my own consulting business. Like I'm going to take off from here. And I'm really curious what that is like, just from from a, you know, starting up that type of business. Yeah, I mean, I, I think entrepreneurship in general, I always looked up to my dad who started his own uh, business pretty early on. So I got to see him um, and it, it was totally different domain, financial services. Mm-hmm. And it was a small business and he, he ran it for many years. And so I just got to see the value of like delivering good service, charging something fair, working with the same group of employees that were happy and you could run a business and Customers were happy and employees were happy at the same time. It wasn't like business was seen as a negative thing, which sometimes, you know, gets portrayed where you have to, you know, be mean or rude to your employees or not, you know, make, make someone who, who likes to come back there. So that was kind of the original of it. I've always had a little bit of a dual um, techie and non-techie background. Like in, in college, I was the only engineer on the debate team. <laughs> which it just is like a little bit of a insight into me because I always enjoyed speaking and, and writing and, and interacting with people. Whereas most the in, image of a typical engineer, which I could be sometimes is just, you know, it's dark. Like if you ever walk in, I'm sure you walk into your software <laughs> engineers, the lights are off, you know, the <laughs> windows are blacked out and, you know, the, the only light is their screens and they, they don't want anyone to open their door because they get grumpy real fast. Uh, and so that environment is just totally different. And I think the first move to me was out of engineering and into the realm where um, you're talking to customers about what they want. And so I found that I could get equally excited for writing code to talking with a, a customer about what their problems were to figure out like, why, why, why does a customer want what they want? And that became a really interesting question for me. And you know, I think kind of pull that forward in my career. Um, for me, consulting was an easy way for me to scratch an entrepreneurial ish itch and kind of can do things on my own terms and really contribute back uh, some of my knowledge and expertise in a way that is a little bit more broader scale. So I, I don't have to work for just one company and be a part of that one company. I can work for, I can share that and, and work with lots of different companies that need this kind of expertise. Um, and that, you know, that was a lot of fun. And I saw that e-commerce isn't going anywhere. And so as even, even while I was thinking about the company, I started out interviewing again. And I, I talked to a number of folks that were doing consulting and it became a more real idea, you know, for me. And so that, that's really where it kind of came into a couple of years ago. And the, really the, the simple idea was that e-commerce continues to grow, talent continues to get more scarce. So one of those things has to give. And so I need to be able to, like, to me, the whole idea was to help a wide array of people, not necessarily too wide, but to be very strategic about the big types of e-commerce problems I can, I can help people solve. That's great. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it seems like you already kind of had that, that wealth of knowledge and network, and then you just was able to put it into practice. And we're starting to hear that more too, is the uh, you know, the, finding talent is just harder and harder every <laughs> single day. And, and it's always nice to bring in just people that still have the, the talent and the expertise and you don't technically have to employ them right with the right. company and, and you can just, you know, pretty much get what you want solved. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really easy for them because it's hard to find a full-time employee, particularly in certain things, like all the developer talent has moved to agencies, you know, for instance, like if yeah. you're customizing a e-commerce platform, you know, good luck finding a, an independent freelance Magento developer. You know, like they, they, they don't exist. They literally, they're, they're like unicorns. You know, they're all in agencies. And so finding independent people that are hard, that want to join a company, particularly for a retailer or a brand, you're not a technology company. You know, your, your, your job is to create products. And so 
tech and e-commerce, it's not really in your DNA a lot of times. And so it's easy to say, let me, let me go to someone who can help me get this set up. And then they can teach me how to run it. And then maybe I don't need them anymore. And to me, that's totally fine. Uh, which is, is, is teaching people to fish a little bit, yeah. uh, once they get the business going. Uh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. And we're actually wrapping up here on time and, um, you know, Rick, appreciate you having on here. This has uh, been great conversation. Travis, do you have any final thoughts? No, I'm always just curious, you know, um, Rick, any, anything else on your mind, anything that we <laughs> might not touched on, um, the last or kind of give you the last, the last word, if there's <laughs> anything you want to chat on or any questions for us or things that we wanted to talk about in general. No, I, I, I think it's great. You know, one of the questions you had is like, do you ever get tired of listening to earnings call? I don't, like, yeah, yeah. I don't even know when that started. Um, <laughs> but you know, p- part of the things I, I, I write about things that I think people are interested in. And so, you know, the reason I write about Shopify and Amazon and FedEx and UPS is because it affects like, every mer- every brand, merchant, software developer, consultant, agency is affected by things that these companies do. Uh, and so, I, you know, the easiest way for me to add value is to try to figure out like what are these companies trying to do, so that if you're in the e-commerce world anywhere, how to figure out what it means and earnings calls. I mean, I'll be honest, it, it's a lot of investor BS. I don't care about most of it. You know, I miss earnings by this point or I, it doesn't matter to me at all. I care about why they're doing what they're doing. Um, that's what I care about. And usually don't get any of that information until investors start asking questions and the CEO answers. Um, that's the stuff that I'm listening for. Like if you're on the Shopify earnings call and then you hear Harley answering you know, nothing against Harley, 10 questions from investors. And then an investor asks a question, Harley's quiet and Toby answers. Like right. that's the question that's the most interesting because you know, nobody else wants to take the question. They all punted it to him. And then like, so, so that's, to me, that's the funnest part of it. <laughs> no, that's great. And it's, and I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, you're one of the first people I'm just, you know, I, I see I'm on LinkedIn, I'm scrolling, I see you post something. I'm like, I got to read this. It's it's great because it's like you're taking an earnings call that nobody would just, you know, could fall asleep to. Nobody listening. would and it's, to it. <laughs> and, 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 but you pick out, you know, a lot of the sections that like that stands out. And it's so um, it's just so insightful, and to be honest. And it's and it's it's kind of like a um you have this talent of just being able to pick up <laughs> off of these calls. Um, so I, I, again, I, that's great. And I love all the posts that you're doing. Obviously anybody that's listening, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people probably follow you that's listening right now. Um, and on this uh, podcast, but if you haven't definitely go check out Rick on, on LinkedIn and, and what are, what are some other, you know, plugs you can throw in here for everybody else? you got the podcast coming. That's right. Yeah. A new, new podcast, podcast or just search, uh, on Apple or Stitcher, wherever you are, just search for the Watson weekly. And it's really just a digest every week of, of e-commerce news. Um, and I also include things like investments. So like um, w- when people get VC rounds or whatever, they get acquired. I, you know, I talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, find me on LinkedIn. Just look, you know, look for Rick, Rick Watson or my website, uh, rmwcommerce.com. So. Perfect. Well, thanks for that, Rick. Again, thanks for jumping on. Everybody that's listening, give us a check and make sure to subscribe and like um, all of our episodes. Obviously, we're on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, or Apple Podcasts, whatever that is, um, and YouTube as well. Um, Rick, thanks for jumping on. Everybody go check out their website, his website, and uh, the podcast. Um, and uh, thank you for the time today. Thanks, guys. Thanks, all Rick. Right. Thanks a lot.